Okay, I'm going to kick off with some questions. Uh, I wanted to ask, and this is to all of you, but I know that, um, John, you're a big fan of the Outlaw movie, and um, which originated in Australia. And you'd spoken about your desire to make a film with kind of Western elements that incorporated the backdrop of Australia's uh, bloody colonial past. And there was a resistance to that in Australia. And at one point, you were going to have to film in South Africa, I believe. Can you talk a bit about that and how you were able to ultimately overcome that resistance? Well, um, persistence, really, just <laughs> being like five years of banging your head against a brick wall. Um, I think the, um, uh, the resistance from Australia was they hadn't seen this view of history before and they were rather alarmed at how brutal and bloody the depiction of the frontier was. So I think it came as too much of a shock um, and hence the resistance. Um, and hence we just put our heads down and went to other avenues, other possibilities, and finally broke that brick wall down. I also <laughs> wanted to ask, and Kat and I were talking a bit about this beforehand. Um, you worked with the First Nation community. You shot in, in Winton in Queensland, and you worked with the First Nation community there. Uh, and you've spoken about how they really understood the power of the land and the spirituality of the land. Um, but you also spoke about how they embraced the cast and kind of blessed everybody on the film. So I, I wondered if you could say, all of you can join in and say something about the importance of that, casting the First Nation community and having them on board in the spirit of the film. If, you, if nobody go? speaks, I'll pick someone. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm happy to start, but um, <clears throat> this film was the first time I ever went to Australia. And the one thing that became incredibly clear to me um, was that this script, this story, was part of yet another chapter of our dark, far-flung um, imperial past, um, ill-begotten in every way. The massacres were horrendous. And that the more I began to understand, and, and our co-producer in, in, in Australia and, and, and Chiara in the early days, and John especially, worked really hard with, um, we had a, um, an indigenous uh, um, advisor on the film, and because we were working with sacred lands, and it seemed to me that this was not a place for white people. I remember going with Danny to walk around the graveyard of the Winton graveyard, and literally all the graves were young Victorian women and children. We couldn't survive there. We shouldn't have been there. It was the First Nation. It belonged to somebody else. And we, um, as Ray says, his Ray's character says, we tried to civilize it, which was an insanity, an insanity. And what we see, and the violence we see in the film, is because it was this brutal takeover of this vast place that we should never have done. You mentioned the violence. I want to come back to the violence. But uh, when actors and, and um, film people talk about the hardships of the shoot, I'm, I'm never very sympathetic. Uh, but with this film, I have sympathy. I mean, watching it in that great new restoration on that huge screen, um, the flies mm. and the heat. Um, you know, there's that great sequence after the flogging where you see people's backs mm. literally covered in flies. Mm. And so I wondered if he could say, because I think it was your first time in Australia, I think you said it was Ray's first time in Australia as well, if you could say, you, if you could also say something about working under those kind of conditions, it must have been very, very difficult. Oh, Emily, you had to wear the costumes. I, I just remember it, um, someone saying to me, it's like being in a video game and we just keep going up to another level every day. It was so hot, I think, because the, the money wobbled and the, we've pushed from when it would have been relatively bearable to unbearably Unbearable, hot. Yeah. 
were sort of 40 degrees on set. Summer, shot in summer. And we were all in woolen, you know, I was in corsets and <laughs> petticoats and wool costumes and, um, I mean, really, really, it just, just didn't, it, I've never been anywhere on earth where it felt like it had, it was utterly indifferent to my existence. And, Not to uh, say hostile. Yes. <laughs> And there was one bit where John Hurt's in the bar um, and he's wearing a all th three-piece suit and hair and the works. And the bar was so hot that the lights were popping. It was over 50 degrees. I think they, probably the film in the camera melted as well. And it was the only place where there were no flies. It was the only place that the script called for the flies. <laughs> needed a fly wrangler. We had a fly oh, wrangler. didn't have a fly wrangler. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, the, 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 I think the, Danny, sorry, John. Danny, I think Danny actually uh, learned to love the flies. I got the impression. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I did. Well, I had to. There were fellow actors in the way, and and um, and uh, one had to um, uh, a character like like Arthur Burns. Um, you don't want to see him be flinching and, and sort of moving around in this static kind of way. Uh, you, you want to see some sort of harmony uh, with him and, and the flies. Uh, one of the uh, first questions I asked when, when John said this is a, a newly digitized uh, uh, copy of, 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 of the film was uh, uh, how, how, the fly, how the detail of the flies <laughs> is reflected uh, in, in the screen. And it sounds like it, it, it had, had an impact <clears throat> on, on you possibly tonight. Uh, and also the blood, as I think was just pointed out, is, is of a sweet solution. So the, so the flies uh, tend to um, gravitate. And, and they get out of the corner of your eyes and the corner of your mouth, uh, of course, where they, where they find some, some humidity. Um, and it was a rather tough uh, experience, but one one that was very gratifying at the end of the day when, when one had a beer at, at, uh, at, at, the, at the place that we were staying. Uh, the Boulder Mopel, Opal Inn? Yeah. Boulder Mopel. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Opal. Yeah. It was madness. The whole yeah. thing was utter madness. The sort of spirit of the violence and the insanity that you see in that film, we all experienced making this movie. It was like nothing I've ever it was really insane. Did you, in did a you great way. All, do you all remember Ray Winston and Ray, your beautiful reaction to the flies? Do you remember that one? When you. Uh, it might happen to me, John. Because <laughs> I probably had started, several. You started hitting your own face and, and cursing and screaming. Do you remember? Yeah, that? yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think that happened a few times. The, uh, the thing for me was, um, I, I remember, you know, we, we had to take loads of water in. It was a, a litre every kind of half an hour or something. And I thought I'd drunk enough water. And I was sitting on the horse and I had to go from A to B. And I knew where I had to go, but m my body wouldn't allow me to do it. My head had completely gone and they had to stop the horse from going off. And I'm quite a good horseman, you know, I know how to ride a horse. And quite unaware about the situation I was in and I was taking off the horse and sat down and then drank another litre of water but it just kind of crept up on you that heat I, I saw amazing amazing things it's an amazing country Australia I think they hadn't rained for five years mm. in the place it was something like that yeah. and um, one night a deluge came down and we had a flood and I woke up the next morning and the plants had grown something like four to five foot. And instead of the land being red, it was mauve with plants as far as I could see. I may be exaggerating slightly, but <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. It was, it's, it's quite an amazing country. I think probably one of the most enjoyable jobs I've ever worked on, and educational as well. Daniel, I wanted to go back and ask you about your character because watching it again tonight, like a lot of the characters in the film, there's such a contradiction because you appreciate poetry, you appreciate culture, you talk about the beauty and the spirit of the land, but don't take this personally, you're a savage. Um, you know, a very bestial savage described as a, as a dog. Um, 
But was it enjoyable to play someone that had both of those elements within them? Um, you know, the barbarity, but also the appreciation of beauty. Um, well, yes, it was enjoyable. Beautifully written by, by, by Nick Cave. And uh, um, uh, yes, I think you described him correctly. He's a sort of cosmic uh, psychopath um, uh, who has a, um, has a morality. The morality is, 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 is quite, um, in a way, pure. Um, um, in contrast um, with... Uh, Ray's character, who's trying to civilize, in a sense. Also, I guess Arthur Burns being Irish um, is something that speaks about that subject, that very subject. Um, and um, his alliance with his brothers is is is, is strong, and um, that he be killed, sort of in sort of Cain and Abel esque way, by his brother who loves so much, is is also poetic. Uh, um, it uh, feels very Nick Cave. It feels very much like a like a ballad in a sense. Um, so yes, yeah, great fun to play to play that character, and and encouraged by John to um, to keep him keep him violent when, nece when necessary. By the way, uh, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis send oceans of love to you all. Um, they couldn't join, unfortunately. I'm going to come back to the, those those two, um, but I wanted to ask because you mentioned Ray's character, Captain Stanley. Ray, for, for, for you, for me, I think that you always excel when you're playing these characters that have this real edge, you know, these kind of outsider figures. And again, as with, with Arthur Burns, there's this massive contradiction in Captain Stanley because his love for his wife, Martha, mm. is very, very deep. You know, he has this idea of civilization and civility, but it's him that sets in motion this terrible, immoral action which drives the film, the proposition of the the proposition of, of the title. Again, is that, that kind of duality as an actor something that, that kind of you find easy to, to tap into? I don't know. Is the easy question? Okay, really moving on very answer. swiftly. <laughs> way, because, because it's... I don't, I, I'm always kind of perceived as the bad guy, I guess, you know, but I, I always try to find something else within the character, you know, the man, the man's British, he's there working on behalf of the British government to actually civilise the land. Um, and as Danny said, there's the English to Irish problem, that's always going to be that kind of, I don't know, the long age, it's, they're always smashed together. I found it very easy to actually um, fall in love with Emily, I mean, you know, what an actress to have playing your wife. Uh, it was fantastic for me. And just to be alongside people like Danny Houston, you know, I met great, great, great people out there. I actually fell in love with Australia. Um, and I kind of feel that I'd have probably been one of the rebels if I'd been around at the time. You know, but to play Captain Stanley as, as an actor, it was all kind of there on the page in a way. You know, Nick's, the first thing I said when I, I read Nick's script, well, is this, is this a one-off? Is this, has he just been lucky and wrote something that we can kind of delve into and understand and feel? And then I read a couple of more of Nick's scripts and I realised that the man's a, a very, very clever writer, you know? So as an actor who's, who had never been really to Australia before and didn't really understand, I've been to America, it's a kind of a different place completely, you know? Um, it was on the page, and then you've got a director like Johnny Yorko, who, um, who allows you to bring stuff to the table, you know, and that allows you to feel, as a working actor, that you have something to give, you know, ideas. Um, and it, as I say, it's a long time ago we made this film, so it's very hard for me to tap back into it, really, you know? I think you'd have enjoyed seeing it. I enjoyed it You'd enjoyed seeing it tonight. Yeah. It looked terrific. And I know that John and the cinematographer, Benoit, have been involved in the restoration. It does look incredible. So terrific job done all, all round. Um, we've mentioned... Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, Ray. We've mentioned Mick, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis. And John, you've collab you collaborated with Nick on Ghosts of the Civil Dead, which I would love to be able to see again. I know there's rights issues with that. And you've collaborated subsequently. My understanding on on the proposition was that 
Nick wasn't originally going to write the script. He was going, you were going to work with him. He was going to flesh out some ideas. And then as expats living in England at the time, you managed to persuade him. How did you manage to persuade him to come up with something which is very unique, I think? Well, I, I probably just drove him mad talking about the soundtrack for so many years and, <laughs> and the frustrations of not quite landing the story. I, I'm very big into research, so I was uh, researching Bush Rangers and the, you know, the whole frontier and the clash between the English and Irish and the whole kind of um, colonial thing and the indigenous struggles. And I had a, just reams of ideas and I've tried different paths and different, even different writer um, that wasn't connected to Australia. And Nick, you know, was born in the outback and uh, raised as a child in the outback. So, and his lyrics in his songs are uh, have very visual narrative characters. So um, just by virtue of discussing it for so long, he got so fed up. Uh, <laughs> you know, the suggestion was, well, why don't you try writing it? <laughs> and then, and it actually started as, okay, just, just do an outline, just do a little, you know, a little story, a short story, and we can get a proper script writer, screenwriter in uh, to, you know, embellish it and do dialogue. And once he started that. Uh... You can always count on technology to let you down. And I, I'll, I'll just add one brief thing, which John will remember here. Um, where it took us a while to get this financed, this film, as I'm sure you can all imagine. Um, and uh, there was one point when Nick turned around to Kiara and I and went, I've done a whole album and a world tour and you haven't even got this film funded. <laughs> he was right. Um, and the soundtrack, of course, that, that, that Nick and Warren worked on, in many ways, I think it's one of their first, if not the first, it's kind of set a template for subsequent work that they've that they've done this mixture of beauty and sort of atonality. It's a it's a terrific it's a terrific score, in heard in all its glory, tonight. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask Emily to come back to you because you're a very you're a very forceful presence in this film because in in, in a world which is barbaric, and in many ways inhumane, you do represent this um, a kind of civilizing force, but also a sense of um, decorum and class, the way you present your home, the way, the way that, you, that, that you dress. Um, how did it feel to be that element in this element which was very, very male, very patriarchal, very aggressive? It felt like we were doing a little Chekhov play in the middle of <laughs> this incredibly violent piece, which was actually a really, you know, it's a very, um, it's like working on a miniature. Give their back. Um, it's like, you know, it's very precise, detailed, gentle. It was great. I mean, but I never, I didn't have to go up into the really challenging part of this. Mm, it came to you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't go up to the caves or any of that. Um, so I had a, a slightly different experience, although from the rest of them. But very challenging nonetheless. And there's also that moment in the film where your, your love for, 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 your husband is obviously very strong, but there is also that moment when you realise the other side of him, and, it, and I think it's when you watch the whipping and you, you, you see your face and your expression completely change. We have another new guest. I'll, I'll announce him in one second. I love doing Zoom Q and A's. So yeah, that, that moment when you recognise right. the other side of him. <laughs> yes. Hello, amazing. Can we do a hey guy? We can do a hey guy. Can we do a hey guy? Hey guy. Hey guy. Hey guy. <laughs> Hey, brother. Hi, everybody. Hey, <laughs> brother. Sadly, that's all we've got time for. This <laughs> Thank um, you very much. So, <laughs> so, sorry, you, you were saying about that moment when you kind of recognise the um, other side of him. Yes, I think she's very... Um, up, well, I think that she's very driven by her, her sense of moral outrage yeah. um, and anger and want, wanting retribution. And then when she's actually faced with the flogging she realizes she's probably been part of something terrible 
um, but they then become they become incredibly isolated because of what he's done and the way he's set this situation up, and they're just marooned together with a encroaching catastrophe. The storm is coming. Yeah. Uh, hello, Guy. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bit, bit worried about your timekeeping, but we'll let it pass this time. Um, <laughs> We, we, we've been talking about some of the characteristics, you know, we, we've spoken about some of the elements of, of Danny's character, some of the elements of Ray's character and Emily's character. Watching the film tonight, there was something which really struck me about a moment that you do in the film, and it's when you go into the household where the massacre took place of the Hopkins family, and you take your hat off. And I hadn't noticed that moment before, and it strikes me that the character of Charlie Burns, of all the characters in the film, is perhaps the one with a strong sense of morality, which seems like quite a twisted thing to say, given his actions. But he seems to understand family, but he also seems to understand the need... I'm sorry you've come into this question. He seems to understand the need to put an end to the violence. He says it has to stop to Arthur at, 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 at the end. This has to stop. W was that interesting to you, these kind of different elements of your character, and the fact that you had this capacity for violence, the love of family, but you seem, to have a sen you seem to have a sense of morality that maybe some of the others, apart from Emily's character, maybe lack. Absolutely. I, I feel that, um, that the, the point at which we find all of our characters in the film, but, but from, a, from a, uh, a personal point of view, the, the point at which we find Charlie in the film is really at the end of the, of the tether. I feel that, that everything that the brothers have experienced, everything that Charlie has experienced up to this point has, has sort of wrung out everything that in, involves and delves into morality and the question of love and, and connection and all of those, all of those elements that, 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 that keep us moving forward as human beings, as well as the extremities of, of the opposite end of the spectrum being utter violence, being survival, um, you know, stopping at nothing to, to get what one needs. And I, and I think that for Charlie to be able to even answer the question that Ray proposes at the beginning of the film, it, it, it's got to a point, I think, for Charlie where I think, I think, there's, no, I think there's no question anymore that, 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 that morality um, has to be the, the winning and driving force. And so if it means having to take out his brother, as you say, having to end this, however, however it is, if it, if it means taking all three of us out, however it, however it has to manifest, uh, I feel that he's reached that nth degree. And I wanted, when we started the film, to find a character who looked and felt as if they'd been through every possible and conceivable horror, um, that 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 meant that he was almost sort of numb now, you know, numb to the um, to, to what 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 sort of what was possible, what this world even meant, and you know, I think I think for a character who is numb to be able to walk into uh, that house, as you point out, and, and take off his hat and still be moved by, you know, the horror that, that one man can do against another, just reminds him and just tells him that really the only way forward for the human race is to, is to answer to morality. So, there we see Charlie just on this sort of sort of almost drifting through this story uh, as the sort of moral centre, I guess. Okay. So yes, it was very appealing, very interesting to me to do. The thing that was interesting also, once we got on set, I mean, when I read the script and I spoke to John about the film and, and you know, it was being sort of put together, it made a great deal of sense. There was no question about it making sense. And then all of a sudden when I got on set, I actually had no idea how to play this character because I realised that I was so taken by uh, the, the, the bigger picture. But that when we got on set, I thought, oh, I don't even know who, who I am in this, how I move, how, what do I sound like, who, who actually am I? So it was quite a strange experience 
to start actually filming the film because you know and of course once we all got together and you know really started to sort of rehearse and get feet on the ground and 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 th then it sort of came uh, to, to sort of became apparent but but I was really surprised that I was so taken and so moved by this story unlike other films perhaps where you you're taken by the story but there's a really clear picture of what it is as an actor you're going to do whereas this I, I really sort of went oh gosh I have no idea what I'm going to do <laughs> so in a way sort of Charlie's character had been sort of stripped from him he was just sort of like a sort of a moral ghost sort of floating through with a sort of mission, you know. So it was and a yet, really interesting experience. I'd say, uh, and yet, um, and this was, it was almost like enforced method for all of you being in that place, in that environment. And I remember actually, Guy, now that it's brought up, the moment when we rehearsed that scene and you were saying, oh, it just like the intuitive responses to the detail of all that came from all of you guys was amazing like what emily danny all of you uh there were all these magic moments that kept emerging like that moment of just taking off that hat i remember was, us talking i remember us talking about about the taking off of the hat and, and yeah. you know little and small things that became big things like the um actor indigenous actor who was explaining yeah. that played um toby the the servant mm. uh, that when he was leaving when he was saying goodbye he explained for aboriginal people the very first thing they would do is take off their shoes because their, their feet connected to the land was their true experience. So that freedom to get rid of those bloody shoes and leave them at the gate, mm. you know, is one of my favorite moments of, of the film. Yeah. But every character and every actor kind of brought that to the table, which was amazing. I want to ask one final thing from me about the legacy of the film, because there's a very good actor in the film called Leah Purcell, lots of very good indigenous actors. And Leah's just directed a film called The Drover's Wife, which is opening in the UK in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And it's in a season at the Barbican at the moment, which is looking at films from Australia dealing with these kind of issues of the past. But it feels like the proposition opened the door for some of these films. Filmmakers like Warwick Thornton, brilliant films like Samson and Delilah and Sweet Thing, it seems to have really, despite the, the hardships that you face to finance it and get it made in Australia, it seems to have really had a legacy. Is that something that you've all noticed and which is important to you? Of course. I mean, we were, we were uh, I, and Leah reminded, reminded us um, that it was the first film in history in Australia to have an actual contract between the Indigenous community. You know, no films had bothered to even you know go through those motions so the connection to the people was quite the original people was very profound and i think all of us a real eye-opening experience that you know and we were blessed with the late great david gopolo and um tom e lewis who are just magnificent you know were magnificent actors um so we yeah it was a huge 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 part of it you know the land and their experience of it do you mean as far as the as far as the sort of the the, the massacre and the representation of aboriginal yeah um, i mean i think people? for people in australia they may have had a sense but i think in a wider global sense that there may not have been the same recognition that some of these things took place well to be honest even in australia you know when you when you not so much now but when i was at school when you do australian history uh in in school it starts from 1788 and and it's all about the success of uh, Captain James Cook and what came after that. Uh, a lot of the the way in which Aboriginal people were treated by white people is is swept under the carpet. And so I think probably, 
you know, not just our film, that, but films that you talk about uh, that have come, Warwick Thornton's films, etc., that have come afterwards, as well as, you know, as well as political uh, um, sort of positions and statements and things that have come to the fore have been extremely educational for Australian people, particularly in this last 20 years. Um, I, I think, of course, people overseas will be surprised and probably not surprised as well, to be honest, uh, but, but will be, you know, learning a lot from, from films like ours and, and, and the way Aboriginal people have been, been treated, uh, not just back in, you know, the 1880s, but, but, but since then as well. I think that's one of the great things about film, isn't it? Is a, it, it enables us to better understand our pasts, to maybe try and make better futures. Uh, very much so. The first feature film in history um, was uh, the story of the Kelly Gang, and uh, really Australia created the Western in that sense. But the um, colonial authorities, um, they were, it was so popular that they were alarmed at the popularity of the, the outlaws, so they banned it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Australia has been a, a traditionally a pretty conservative place. And actually having just a year and a half there in recent times, I was shocked at, in terms of what Guy was talking about, in terms of the history that's still swept under the carpet. It's, it hasn't progressed very far, I'm afraid. Uh, well, the, I mean, the, uh, I, having been a, both a victim and a witness real violence, um, it's uh, something that's always, there's an always messy, chaotic part, part of it and a shockingness to it. So I just want it to be as matter of fact and, and trying to, you know, not pull any punches, like just be very upfront and honest about it because, um, and I think the key is the aftermath of violence to, and this film is all about that, is to the consequences, because I, I, I guess I have in time realized uh, there's a, yeah, the ethics and morals behind all of this stuff is I think hugely important and this film really explores the you know the actual emotional and um, moral and ethical issues with violence and the after you know it's not just the sensation of the in the moment but it's actually how people react and deal with it after the fact and that's it's sort of the reverberations of it isn't it is it isn't yeah. just the the pain or the physical injury that somebody oh. feels but it's one of the things that John spoke to us about a lot uh, prior to doing the film this sort of that, that, that often violence is sort of short and sharp and yeah. and it takes you unaware and for a lot of people I think they don't even realize what the injury is until later and and so we see the injury but we don't see the weeks and months of trauma and, and the sort of the ongoing um, psychological effect, uh, which is, I think, is what, to speak on your behalf, John, is what you really were keen to sort of portray in the film. And I think, personally, I think a lot of violence in films is sort of left, it's treated more as a, as a kind of a, a piece of excitement that then sort of has no ramifications. It's something to make us jump out of our seats. But I think one of the reasons, going to the, the person who asked the question, you know, the violence in this film stays with you as violence does in your life. It stays with you. I mean, you only have to see the most minor sort of altercation and it can stay with you for weeks. And so, to again, to, to, to sort of point out what John spoke to us about, it really was honouring, I suppose, the, the, the truth of what, of the effect that violence has on us. Uh, and so in a way, you know, it comes back to the, my, my first answer when, when I arrived late, and my apologies for that, um, that, that I think we find a man who's, who, who really is, he's, he's sort of numb to the amount of violence that he's experienced, but he's just so broken from it 
um, because it because it takes its toll.